In a recent survey, a newer associates report spending an average of 15 hours a week on legal research. If you're going to be spending that much of your professional life doing something, it would behoove you to be as efficient as possible. All these other tools that are available to us in legal research are awesome and great and they all can provide extremely powerful and detailed results. I just think Google is also one of those, as long as you're using it smartly. Uh, we're in the Law Library studio today with our two newest law librarians, Amy Taylor and Stephen Wolfson. Thanks for being here, you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This is great. Amy, welcome. You are a new outreach and research librarian, and you come to us from Kroll and Mooring, where you worked as a research librarian in their law offices. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like working around attorneys and helping them with research? So attorneys are very cognizant of their time and how time is money. So they want to be as efficient as possible, but also as accurate and thorough as possible. Mm -hmm. They're, we're almost always a pleasure to work with. Whatever stress they're managing, they don't let it filter down to the library. They're very generous with their praise and their thanks. Um, they are relying more and more on digital. They are relying more and more on legal analytics. Um, just anything to get an edge as far as competitive intelligence and um, bringing in new clients and then keeping their current clients happy. It's interesting that you do research for them and they do research for their clients that might not be related to a, an ongoing matter, but you are helping the clients in other ways. And so that is, it's just always interesting to see what kind of hmm. questions you're going to get. Like what, what would be an example of how, how you might have helped a, a client? So clients in, say, a, the healthcare field who are interested in things that are happening in other countries that may not be so much impacting U the U.S. regulatory scheme and framework, mm -hmm. but they're trying to be forward thinking. And it's, it, yes, it's really interesting. So you are trying to help them do that and, and hopefully fold that into the business that you're, that you're providing for them as well. Mm -hmm. What uh, kind of advice would you give our listeners who are law students as to, you know, the importance of legal research as far as thinking about students who may end up in a practice like the one that you just came from? So in a recent survey, a newer associates um, report spending an average of 15 hours a week on legal research, and 10 of those hours are spent using paid res resources. So if you're going to be spending that much of your professional life doing something, it would behoove you to, to be as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. And there are also things are changing so rapidly with artificial intelligence and the things that databases are doing and the results that they're bringing back to you. It's just important to have a solid foundation so that it doesn't take you as long to get up to speed with the new shiny toy <laughs> of, the, of the month. All right. I was just curious, too, um, uh, I read that you were an intern for the U.S. Supreme Court Library. How was that experience? Was. This was in the summer of 2006. Um, it was a really great experience. I got to, there was about half of the, the time I was there, the opinions were still being drafted. Mm -hmm. So I got to assist um, the clerks and with the research and along with, under the supervision of the other librarians. And um, one day a week, I manned the phones, and sometimes the justice would call, and it was, it was very exciting. And um, so, yeah, it, I got to speak to quite a few of them, so it was, it was really nice. How yeah. fun. Yeah. Cool. So, Stephen, you're our new research and copyright services librarian, and you come from the University of North Texas, where you were a copyright librarian there. What sort of issues did you see come up in your last position uh, consulting with faculty and students that were related to copyright? Well, um, the most common questions I got were mostly related to either classroom use of copyrighted works 
or um, use of copyrighted works in your published materials. Um, and so that would be somebody wants to present something to their class and they want to ask if they need to get clearance for it um, or if there's some other way they can do it. Normally people think about the fair use exception. It's what I like to refer to as everyone's favorite copyright exception. But there's a few other tools within the copyright statute that um, allow educators specifically to use copyrighted materials within their classes. And then similarly in um, uh, in your papers, there's uh, where in um, in academic papers, there's some of the similar questions of whether you can use things without getting clearance for them. Um, sometimes publishers want clearance anyway, um, but there's a question of whether you can use that. And again, we're looking primarily at sort of the fair use statute is what people first think of, but there are some other ways within the statute. Um, and then secondarily. I address sort of author's rights questions. And so those are your questions of um, frequently, well, every time somebody publishes something, um, a journal will ask you for uh, to sign a contract. And frequently those contracts uh, in the past uh, have required authors to sign over their entire copyright, their entire intellectual property rights over to the journal for the right to publish the, uh, the article. Um, that paradigm has been changing a little bit over the past several years. Um, to, to one in wherein um, authors retain their right, their intellectual property rights, but grant to the publisher a right to use this article essentially to first publication um, and to distribution and things like this. Um, and I would consult with people regarding um, whether these contractual provisions make sense, whether they have any negotiation room, room to negotiate um, with, the, with the publisher, uh, and what else they can do. What are some of those other other ways say, which it, within know. copyright where you can um, where you can use Bingo, something besides fair properly use. Yes. Um, that yes. aren't that are other to fair other than fair yes. use? Other than well, fair so use. Well, so fair use is the most broad <laughs> exception to copyright, yeah. right? It allows you to use like theoretically anything. Um, um, but it, the problem with that is that because it's so broad, um, it's also like a little bit unwieldy, right? Like you're always dealing in sort of gray areas when you're talking about fair use. It's sort of managing risk um, because a lot of these things aren't tested um, and you're sort of making a judgment based on like I'm not using too much of something and I'm not taking any, I'm not taking any economic pro uh, um, value away from the authors, things like this. But um, but it is so, it is so broad and so powerful, it's the first thing most people think of. But within the copyright statute, there are a number of exceptions to copyright where you can use things properly um, that aren't necessarily, that um, uh, wouldn't, uh, well, it might constitute fair use as well, um, but you don't necessarily need to like conduct a fair use analysis to think about these things. The easiest one to talk about in the academic context is the face-to-face -face copyright, a uh, face-to-face uh, teaching exception, which essentially allows you to um, to use a lot of um, copyrighted materials in face-to-face -face educational uh, situations. So you're just teaching a class. Um, you can use a lot of copyrighted materials within your class. So for instance, when I teach, I frequently pull things off um, from the internet. Um, and uh, you know pictures or whatever mm -hmm. I use websites and things like that and I don't really worry about copyright at all because of this face-to-face -face education uh, exception now I will say uh, I should uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention that <clears throat> a lot of times people ask me then I don't frequently cite where I get things from. I'll like pull a picture. I, I talk about Coolio in the classes uh, that I teach because there's this fun example with Weird Al that I like to talk about. Um, and I, I just pull a, a picture of Coolio on, you know, from the internet. I don't, I don't whatever, I just find it through Google Images. Uh, and I don't cite like gotten from this website or whatever. Um, and people ask me, is there a copyright problem with that? And my response is, no, copyright doesn't really care about citation. Uh, that's like a plagiarism issue. Mm. And maybe I'm plagiarizing there, but I'm not super worried about that uh, in some presentation I'm giving in class. I, I don't think anybody's assuming that I snapped some photo of Coolio uh, <laughs> and then used it for my presentation. That brings me to my next question, actually. Um, you'll both be teaching, and is there anything you'd like to share with perhaps students who may be your students, your favorite you know, resources from when you were a student, just some general tips. Well, so when I was a law student, um, I bought like every horn book and nutshell uh, that was available. And I frequently liked reading the nutshells before a class I would take because I thought it gave me a good sort of groundwork of understanding for anything before I dove into it. 
it, it helped me a lot. I don't know if that uh, works for everybody as well as it worked for me. Uh, and there's like, uh, you know, a financial burden I took on, right? It's expensive to buy all those worm books. That's why if I had been smarter, I would have used the library's collections, which frequently have a lot of these things uh, or you have access to them, um, you know, uh, through like eBooks or whatever. Um, my favorite sort of trick that I like to talk about in my classes, and I, maybe, maybe I shouldn't like spoil myself for whoever thinks about this, I like to spend time on this, is um, so my favorite tool that um, librarians like to hate on a little bit is Google. Now, Google doesn't need any promotion from me, right? Everybody uses Google for everything. But the thing is that in the library world, we like to talk down a little bit about Google because um, it really gives some people some bad um, research habits, which is, you know, you just like dump, dive right in and start throwing in keywords, and then you assume that if it's not in the first five hits, it doesn't exist. And all these things are true. But the truth is, like, if you, um, if you know how to use Google to your advantage and you go into it with your eyes open, it's like a really awesome tool. And so I talk about a couple operators that I really like. I talk about these all the time. Um, there's the site operator, which tells Google that I only want results back from a certain domain or a, do a range of domains. Um, and uh, uh, this is great for conducting like legislative history research or um, research into what statistical data that the government has collected because you can say, I'm only going to look at you know what information the FCC has pulled on something or has collected on something or reports that the FCC has put out on something. And you can say, Google, only give me stuff back from the FCC. And that narrows your range of information that Google's going to give back to you like dramatically, right? So rather than asking all of Google, you're asking a super small set of stuff that Google indexes. Um, then, and then relatedly with sort of this sort of work, I like to use the file type operator and I like to narrow it to things like just PDFs because you know if the government is putting out something official, they're going to put it out in PDF format. Um, and that again narrows the range of stuff you're looking at. Um, and so what I usually say is that Google is a really super powerful tool as long as you know what you're getting. You can get a lot of false positives, but if you're smart about it, it is awesome. So it takes no time to put a Google um, search in. So your practice yeah. takes one second, you know, uh, and then you use Google all the time for anything anyway. So you're more used to this interface. Yeah. You know, I mean, all these other tools that are available to us in legal research are awesome and great, and they all, um, you know, can provide extremely, you know, uh, uh, powerful and detailed results. Um, I just think Google is also one of those, as long as you're using it smartly. Uh, Amy, so the. The two um, areas that I, especially after working at the firm for a couple of years and, and seeing what attorneys, what they struggle with in, in practice, I talk about knowledge management and current awareness and, and the importance of developing a system, if you haven't already, that is consistent and that you don't really have to think too much about as you go to organize, whether you're using Evernote or OneNote or an app that you find on the on the um, app, Apple Store or some other kind of system that you've developed for yourself, Zotero, if you're incorporating some of that into your work. Um, you just need to be able to, to keep up with everything. And then you also need to stay current and whether you're using the resources that a big firm can provide, whether you are setting up Google Alerts for yourself or and how you're um, channeling all that through your Outlook folders and, and things of that nature, that it's just, it will, it will be um, a bit to get set up like anything, like anything in life that you, you go to, to set it up and you'll make tweaks along the way. But if you can have that really seamless by the time you get out into practice, it is just gonna save you so much time. And there will be situations in which you are able to shine because you just, have mastered this and those around you have not. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll put in a second pitch for current awareness resources because it's a thing that law students frequently um, sort of um, forget about or don't realize how important it is to mm -hmm. stay current in the law because while you're in law school, you know, you're reading all these old cases, mm -hmm. you're sort of very, um, you have a very sort of closed view um, of all of these uh, all of these topics you're studying. Um, but in reality, the, you know, the law is literally constantly changing every single day as new cases come out and staying up on um, uh, on the um, on the current uh, current cases is really really important. It's a thing we you often forget about. And you would be amazed at how many law firm clients just want to know 
what is Congress even thinking about mm -hmm. legislating on? You know, um, there might not even be a bill anywhere in sight, but it, it is, they, they really are, are really trying to plan ahead. So, and there are lots of, um, law firms now have lots of blogs and other um, content that they push out. And so part of being a, a new attorney and developing your, your personal persona, your professional persona is, is being able to draft things like this. And so staying, staying current just helps you to just churn out um, good content. So if, if, you know, if I were a student and I wanted to, like, start developing my, you know, current awareness or my, or my blog writing skills, like, is that something that would, that would come with taking the legal research class or... Is that something that, like, I would come to the library and ask, you know? You could certainly take a research class that I talk about because I would encourage people to, you know, follow uh, current awareness resources. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, uh, I, so uh, one of my old professors, who was my um, copyright professor in law school, uh, he had a later student who started a blog called Copy Hype. Um, which is um, it's a copyright blog. It's a good copyright blog, and um, I believe that it, he started it as a student in order to build his profile in copyright law, and ended up getting a job, I think, in Chicago, uh, doing copyright law, like based in part on this blog. Uh, and so, I mean, if somebody, anybody, wants to develop like their writing skills or their, you know, to show that they have knowledge in an area, a blog is not, you know, not a bad, maybe not a bad way to do it. That's, that's so cool. That's so cool. And I think that um, for the students who will spend the summer after their 1L year at farms, you will either be drafting some of this or you will be doing the research for right. it. And so you will, you will quickly kind of get a feel of. But you can also, um, you know, type in products liability, law firm blog, post on Google, right. and all the... All the law, you will get all of that content, mm -hmm. um, and you can start to see, and then what others are doing, and then through Bloomberg, Westlaw, and Lexis, they link a lot to some of this um, law firm provided content. So you you will, it's not hard to find examples. Mm -hmm. okay. cool. So speaking of students, when <laughs> you were both law students, uh, what was your favorite course that you took when you were in law school? Or courses, if you had multiple that were your favorite. I liked, loved actually, all of the court, all the procedure courses: civil procedure, advanced <laughs> civil procedure, criminal procedure, one, criminal procedure two, uh, federal courts, conflict of laws. You know, any time we got to talk about the the Erie Doctrine, I was just in heaven. So I I just liked all the all the stuff about the law and like how it how the process works. So those were all my favorites. Uh, oh, and remedies. Oh, remedies. <laughs> <laughs> remedies was fabulous. Like you get to the end of a case or, or an arbitration and you've got this this judgment and you're like, woohoo, I won. And then you're like, oh, but wait, you've got to be able to collect on it. And and then like even before you've won, you're like, what remedies am I going to ask for? What are all my options? And it's 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 just, it was, it was one of the best courses. <laughs> so I'm really glad that you mentioned a range of things because uh, I, I was thinking, oh, how do I... How do I just say one? Well, I, I'm, I'm like the copyright librarian, so obviously I really liked copyright, and that's true. I, I love I loved my copyright class, uh, and and I really liked uh, all of my IP classes. I really like copyright and trademark in particular, but part of that is because in, in copyrights and trademarks, like the first case I ever read in IP was a case that dealt with the Elvis Presley estate, uh, and man, I just really got into you know reading these law these. Um, you know, these like uh, bits of law about things like I knew, right? There's a famous copyright case that deals with the comic character Spawn and a conflict between the um, Neil Gaiman, who everybody knows, right, uh, and Todd McFarlane, who came up with the character Spawn. And, and it was just fun to read uh, those sorts of things. So I really got into that. Um, but, uh, you know, I took some other uh, classes I really liked. And, you know, part of it is that when you're a student, like, you really get into some, you know, 
professors, right? And like mm -hmm. the professors are really fun. So, you know, civil procedure was a class that I think I wouldn't have liked as much if I didn't have just like a wonderful faculty member who, who taught it to, uh, to me, who has unfortunately passed now. Um, but, uh, and I also took a class on presidential power, um, which is sort of a, um, uh, 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 which is very difficult, uh, taught also by a really great faculty member. Um, and, uh, I feel like I learned, uh, a lot of, in that class that I will never actually implement. Um, but you know, I get to, when I complain about politics, which I do a lot, um, it, you know, it comes, it comes in handy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so since you'll both be working the reference desk, assisting you know students, faculty, maybe even some uh, law school staff, and you know who knows the public um, from your previous work histories in uh, libraries, what is the weirdest or strangest uh, reference question or request for something that you've ever gotten? Well, I. I, I wouldn't exactly classify it as weird or strange, but it was just the one I will never forget. When the summer that I was interning at the library at the Supreme Court, um, a justice called down to the court, and, and I shall not name him, but it will be, become obvious to you when I tell you what his question was, that it had to be a him. Um, he had been invited to a morning wedding and wanted to know what etiquette said about the proper attire to wear. So we had um, borrowing privileges at the Library of Congress. So we gathered up various etiquette books and gave him a, a sample of, of choices or, you know, answers, and he was delighted. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting one. Um, that's an interesting question. I think that, um, so I worked at the University of Texas in Austin for a number of years um, uh, as a reference librarian. And um, so Texas was its own country for like eight years, which they won't let you forget. Um, and uh, it was really common for people to come in um, to the library looking for, um, uh, for information about the, um, the laws of the Republic of Texas. But um, commonly this was, uh, for instance, they didn't want to pay their federal taxes, and they believed that there was something within uh, the founding of Texas that would allow them to avoid paying their taxes. And the first time that I got this sort of question, I thought, oh, you know, this, that's interesting. Um, and, but then it, it was... It was somewhat regular um, that I realized that this is a thing uh, down there um, and uh, it was always uh, it, it was it was always a, a like an interesting request <laughs> so you're both relatively new to Athens how do you like it so far and what would do you have any advice for um, our, our students who are coming in and moving to Athens well I love Athens so far I um, I have moved from Washington, D.C., and I love that I don't have to take public transportation unless I really, really want to. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not an essential part of my day-to-day -day life. I just find that to be very um, liberating. Not, not so good for the environment, but very liberating personally. Um, I, I just think it's a great... Um, it's just fun to explore all the new restaurants or new to me restaurants and and just get, get, kind of get a feel for the for the city. But it, it's mm -hmm. it's great. Have I, you felt welcome? I've felt very welcome. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and really, the only thing I miss is um, I'm not able to get as many things delivered as quickly in Athens as mm -hmm. I was in in the the middle of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because I can just get in my car and drive and go get it, and I don't, <laughs> I don't have to worry about why would it would it take me two hours to get there on public transportation? So it all oh, it all yeah. evens Very out good. in the end. So yes, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I was most rec recently living in the Dallas area, and I mean. You could. It was not uncommon that I'd order something on Amazon and I could get it that day, and that's just wow. still mind-boggling to me. Or like Sunday deliveries, and man, uh, you know, that spoiled definitely for sure. But um, yeah, my favorite was yeah. the um, I could place an order, and someone would go to Costco and shop for me and bring it to my apartment that afternoon. It was uh, amazing. Yeah. Like I didn't have to fight the Costco 
a circus. Oh, wow. Someone I could pay someone to do that for me. I feel like it you could amazing. establish like a whole business doing that. Yes. You know, yes. I, could, I should set yes. myself up as an LLC, just going Costco <laughs> shopping for people. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they would call you if they couldn't find exactly what you had asked for and asked if they could make a substitution or you know, etc. And it was it was amazing. So. Side note, while I was in Austin, uh, joking about, uh, not joking, well, while I was joking about people shopping at Costco for people, while I was in Austin, um, there's a famous barbecue joint called Franklin's, and uh, famously, to get into Franklin's, you, like, line up at 5, 6 in the morning uh, to eat to eat lunch <laughs> at, you know, 10, 10.30 in the morning or whatever, uh, and some enterprising <laughs> students um, offered to, like, go sit out on the line for people uh, for s some amount of money. Seemed brilliant to me. That has become a thing. <laughs> in DC at some of the hot new restaurants don't take reservations and they are people you know they're you can pay people to wait in line for you yes. yeah. Yeah. for what it's worth Franklin's is really good I, I don't know if it's worth <laughs> getting up at six in the morning to go for there's other good barbecue but, but it's good <laughs> barbecue I haven't eaten barbecue here but oh. I am skeptical <laughs> oh, okay. uh, like so I was vegetarian for 18 years and I um, started eating meat again while I was living in Austin and one of the first things I ate was uh, was real Texas barbecue and if you've never had Texas barbecue it's a thing unto itself it's the most amazing thing I've ever had it's just it's unlike anything else uh, I can imagine um, but um, but I'll, I'll, I'll reserve judgment <laughs> on George barbecue until I try it you know um, but I'm, I'm you know I'm, I, not uh, my my you know my bar is very high Right. You try, maybe you can report back later. That's right. Of it. Yeah, yeah. I do live near a barbecue joint, so we'll see. You know, if maybe it, that'll be my first try. So I, you know, because like the investment cost is low, I just right. barely have to go anywhere to do it <laughs> to go to it. Um, but yeah, so I, I love Athens. So I, as I mentioned, I was most recently living in Dallas, and um, I, Dallas is a, is okay, um, but uh, it's very flat, and it, there's a lot of concrete sort of everywhere. Um, and it wasn't the kind of place where um, my family felt like we had like any sort of community. We felt um, it we just didn't fit for us. Um, not just because I found it like not very attractive, but um, besides that, like I said, we just didn't it, like the community aspect didn't click for us. We didn't feel like we had a community there. And um, having moved to Athens, first of all, it's of course really green here, which is super pretty. Um, it's hilly. I'm a bike commuter, which makes bike commuting a little more challenging, but um, I'm okay with that. Um, and I like the hills because they add to the prettiness. Um, and um, uh, and like people have been exceptionally nice and friendly to us. Oh, good. Uh, I feel like Athens has like community and charm just sort of everywhere, uh, and that's kind of what we were looking for um, when we moved here. And so so far, it's playing out as planned. Very cool. So speaking of your sort of personal interests, um, what are each of your sort of favorite things to do, like hobby-wise? And perhaps what is the most recent, you know, book or movie or some something you've enjoyed that you could share with our listeners that would give them a glimpse of your sort of personality? Well, I'm a crossword puzzle fiend. Oh, I <laughs> love a crossword puzzle. And... I love college football, so... Um, You're in a good town for that. I am. I'm very excited about that. I recently adopted two kittens, so I spend a large amount of time just watching them try to get into various things and, and out of various things. It's amazing. There is there is apparently a, a secret hidey hole in between the dishwasher and the refrigerator and they have found it and I'm thinking this is only going to last for them for a couple more weeks and then they're going to get too big but I think when they figure out they can't get in and out anymore they're going to be devastated um, <laughs> because they are loving it right now and then they come out of the and they've got dust all over their whiskers and they're you know I'm just trying to like clean them off and they're <laughs> it is hilarious um let's see books and movies I recently read uh, the Woman in the Window, the new thriller that's mm -hmm. being made into a movie with Amy Adams, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was a notch above, like it was very well written. It wasn't, I mean, it was a thriller in the sense that I was on the edge of my seat, but it was also well written. So it was it was also a literary pleasure to read, which sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And then I haven't seen any movies lately, but I um, recently binge watched the, the HBO show Barry. With Bill oh, Hader. Oh, it's really good. Yeah, it's like eight episodes. It's a half hour, yeah. and it's got Henry Henry Winkler in it, mm -hmm. and um, 
it, it is it is it goes it goes places that you don't see coming and it is it is really great so I, I highly recommend that mm -hmm. um, so uh, well as far as um, hobbies and life outside of work goes I, I have a two-year-old and so a lot of my life is um, you know his life right now <laughs> and a lot of the movies I watch um, are his life and I'll, you know are his movies but I'll mention that like some of these movies that are for kids that he can enjoy that uh, um, I can actually kind of get into them right so you know, a lot of parents complain about watching the movies that their that their kids like um, because you end up watching the same things over and over and over again of course um, but I you know I found that some of them I kind of have been enjoying so I've probably watched the trolls movie like the you know the trolls like the little dolls from the 90s um, I probably with the movies with um, Justin Timberlake uh, and um, Anna Kendrick, and I like kind of really like it. It's so it's bizarre, and I kind of get into the music, and I, I feel like I'm not supposed to like it, but I kind of do. My nieces have the uh, nieces who are three and six, and they the DVD has the karaoke version, <laughs> and so oh, yeah. they like to sing along. Um, the music is. It is a that, it's a big deal. That song by Justin Timberlake, I get into that. I, that is <laughs> yep. a good one. Yeah. Uh, the 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 um, the radio the radio song, whatever it's called. And I was playing, um, trying to introduce my nieces to some of my '80s music. So I was <laughs> playing some Cyndi Lauper for them, and we got to the Time After Time song, mm -hmm. and my eldest niece said, "And Amy, that's the Trolls song." <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, to you it is, but to me it is. <laughs> so yes, it, it's it's great. Yeah, but other than that, so I'm a cyclist, uh, and I'm really looking forward to um, biking in Athens. And I hear you have this thing called the Twilight Criterium next year. Oh my! And I'm yes. I'm very excited about. Uh, yes. I'm very excited about it, but I'm really looking forward to again, like um, uh, riding your bike in like, the city of Dallas is not like super attractive. So out here in the in the greenery yeah. sounds great. Um, other than that, I'm like a big movie watcher. There's um, this film festival that I've gone to every year for the past number of years uh, in Austin called Fantastic Fest. Uh, and sadly, I won't be going this year because you know I, it's a little bit more difficult living now in Georgia. Um, but it is just I usually call it my Christmas because it's just it's my time. <laughs> it's the best. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm a kind of a big Star Wars fan, so um, right now is a good time for me, uh, you know, other than the controversy over Star Wars movies, but I don't know, I love them. I'm going to throw a pitch out for Solo. I thought Solo was fun. I don't know. <laughs> no, not a lot of people went to see it, unfortunately, but I thought it was really fun. Um, uh, other than that, um, so I'm reading a book right now called The Wise Man's Fear, which is the second in a series called The King Killer Chronicle by um, Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, the first one is called um, The Name of the Wind. Uh, I have very complex feelings about this series right now. Um, very complex. But they're, they're worth reading if you're into fantasy novels. The content and opinions shared by faculty, staff, students, and former students in the On Reserve podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the University of Georgia, UGA School of Law, or the University System of Georgia. They are also not intended as legal advice. Please contact the Law Library at law.uga.edu library for more information.